Uh, yeah, good day. Now, I'd like to have a word or two with you uh, concerning some of the more disturbing allegations made during the year about no lesser personage than me very good self with particular regard to my recently published and really rather exquisite political memoir, Money for Judgment. Now, the first thing I'd like to point out is that at no time did I deceive Mr Whitlam. If Mr Whitlam was under the impression that the Governor-General couldn't sack the government if he didn't like the cut of its jib, or if he thought I acted on instructions from certain graziers in the Noreen area, or if he thought that this country was a democracy, then he deceived himself and be it on his own head. Now, rather a lot of uh, misunderstanding has grown up, of course, around the precipitate action I took on November the 11th, 1975, in my capacity as GG, and also at the Melbourne Cup, slightly above my capacity, as I recall, as a drunk at the GGs. And in order to answer some of the more outrageous calumnies, I've decided to just run through the story for you, uh, beginning right here and now. As I woke up on the morning of November the 11th, I was acutely aware that events of great political import were looming, and I would have to agonise later in the day about what to do. For the moment, though, I would busy myself with how to get out of my pyjamas. Now, this is the sort of thing a man has to do on his own, and as I searched for the cord and the buttons, I felt an intense feeling of loneliness. My good lady wife was present throughout the pyjama crisis, and I shall never forget the love and support she provided. I explained everything to her, and we tried to recall how I'd got into my pyjamas the night before so that we could reverse the process and remove the flannel encumbrance from the Queen's representative. Eventually, I saw no point in delaying the affairs of state any longer, and I put a morning suit on over top of the pyjamas and went down to a nice little light breakfast of gin and tonic. After breakfast, I packed the plates up and thought of the constitutional crisis that I could see was about to engulf us all. Gough was still refusing to hold an election, Malcolm was still denying supply, and the dishwasher was on the blink for the fourth day in a row. Now, as an essentially working-class boy from Balmain, I've always felt intensely isolated in the company of dishwashers and I couldn't bend over and effect proper repairs because, of course, the pyjamas under my suit prevented me normally supple body from moving with its customary ease. I discussed the matter at great length with Lady Dag, and we agreed that there can be very few feelings of desperate personal loneliness to rival the sensation of being at the very vortex of a political crisis and alone in a room with bulky clothing and a faulty dishwasher. I think there are very few people who understand quite what it's like to feel so desperately alone, and although I've always been a very private person... I did begin to feel the weight of me constitutional solitude becoming more oppressive on me person as the minutes ticked by. What was I to do? I discussed the crisis with Lady Dag over a bottle of liniment and I resolved that I would have to act alone. On me own, with no one else, on me Patma. Personally, solo. On me own, personally, alone, without recourse to anyone else in the world. I then spoke to Mr Whitlam and Mr Fraser about it and I decided the time had come for action. Now, there have been various suggestions made that I was merely a functionary at this stage for conspiratorial persons. And let me say right now that nothing could be further from the truth. There was no conspiracy whatsoever. I acted alone, and even now I have no regrets about having done so. Something had to be done, and as I was the only person I knew, I had to do it. Then the dog got a little bit micturitional on the carpet, reminding me that life goes on through everything, and I still think that to this very day. As the morning got into its stride, I realised that I would have to do something about the deepening crisis that surrounded our political system. Something had to be done, and as this is a democracy, it had to be done by a Democrat. And no one could be more dedicated to the principles of democracy than I am. Always have been. I was appointed by the democratic process, and now, in order to save it, I would have to kill it. This realisation disturbed me profoundly, and such was my sadness and intense loneliness that I decanted me lunch with very little enjoyment on that particular day, I then called upon the party leaders and informed them that I had reached a decision. I outlined the decision for them and told them I thought it was really all for the best. Now, Mr Fraser saw me point immediately, and I must say it was a pleasure to do business with him. He behaved honourably throughout the crisis and he shared my concern about the way things had been going. Mr Whitlam, au contraire, behaved like a little boy. I've never seen anybody so angry. I thought he'd understand me better. After all, he'd appointed me, and if nothing else, I think I was entitled to a little loyalty from him. But I know. He ranted like a child and shouted and even suggested I couldn't do it. In fact, he hasn't spoken to me since, which will give you some idea of how immature he's been about the whole thing. Later on in the afternoon, we had a man in to fix the dishwasher and Lady Dag and I had a few hands of cribbage in the late afternoon sun. There's only so much a man can do in one day. Well, there we are. That concludes extracts from me book. The book came out during the year and did very nicely indeed. Thank you very much. Copyright Sir F. Dag, Money for Judgment, published by Printer Dag Publications. Good evening.